Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Well, good morning. I'm Father Jim Shea. I'm pastor of St. Peter, and welcome to our parishioners and, and our friends to this 21st Kennedy Lecture, uh, the gift of Thomas and Richard Kennedy, who are with us this morning. Thank you. It's, a, it's given in memory of their parents, Keith and Joan Kennedy, who were active St. Peter parishioners. And this annual Kennedy Lecture uh, challenges our parish to live our Jesuit charism, to embrace a faith that does justice, to respond to the universal apostolic preferences of the Society of Jesus. Our lecture th this morning addresses very directly the apostolic preference that we walk with the excluded, walk with the poor, the outcast, those whose dignity has been violated in a mission of reconciliation and justice. St. Peter is very grateful for our close collaboration with Jesuit Refugee Service USA, and we're delighted uh, to have its executive director, Joan Rosenhauer, address us today. 40 years ago, Father Pedro Arupe, then the Jesuit Superior General, began Jesuit Refugee Service. So we begin today with his prayer that we might see with the eyes of Christ. So let us pray. Grant me, O Lord, to see everything now with new eyes, to discern and test the spirits that help me read the signs of the times, to relish the things that are yours, and to communicate them to others. Give me the clarity of understanding that you gave St. Ignatius. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I turn over the microphone now to Peter Judge, who is the chair of our Kennedy Committee. Peter? Thanks, Father Shea. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have so many people interested in this topic and, and who have faithfully attended the Kennedy Lecture over the years. Of course, we're very, very grateful to Tom and Richard Kennedy for their continued support of this series. I'd just like to take a moment to, to recognize our committee members, um, along with Father Shea, who helps us and guides us. Um, those members are Cynthia Aziz, Joan Guthrie, Christine Pearson, Cindy Rios, Susie Shermer, and myself. And thanks too to Jean Katz, who helped us with all the technical arrangements for today to make this go well. Our speaker, as Father Shea mentioned, is Joan Rosenhauer, who is Executive Director of Jesuit Refugee Services USA. In this role, Joan leads the organization's efforts in the US to fulfill its mission to accompany, to serve, and to advocate for refugees and displaced people in over 50 countries around the world. Joan has spent most of her career advocating for social justice and mobilizing the US Catholic community to do the same. As an executive vice president of Catholic Relief Services, which many of you know about and contribute to, Joan led the organization's outreach, marketing and communications, helped those in the United States to respond to critical needs all over the world. Prior to joining Catholic Relief, Joan spent 16 years with the US Conference of Catholic Bishops where she most recently served as the Associate Director of the Department of Justice, Peace and Human Development. And prior to that role, she held a variety of positions, including Special Projects Coordinator and Outreach Coordinator for the US CCB's Department of Social Development and World Peace. Joan has a bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Iowa a master's degree in public policy management from the University of Maryland. And she's been awarded honorary doctorates at Dominican College, St. Ambrose University, 
and Georgetown University. Joan hails from Chicago, and she is the 2009 recipient of the Harry Fagan Award from the Roundtable Association of Diocesan Social Action Directors. And finally, she attends St. Casimir Parish in Baltimore. So we are very, very pleased and happy to have Joan Rosenhauer join us today to give us our 21st annual Kennedy Lecture. Joan? Hello, everyone. And um, let me start by adding my thanks um, to Father Shea for inviting me to do this, to Jean and Peter and uh, Joan Guthrie, who I'm, with whom I've worked most directly, and the whole committee for planning this, to the Kennedys for supporting it, and all of you for being here on this Saturday morning. Um, I'm so honored to be asked to do this uh, because I have this chance to be with you and because when I look at the list of speakers you've had, I'm just honored to be on that list. When I was asked to give this presentation originally, of course, we thought it would be in person, um, but it was really focused on the, the uh, millions of families who have been forced to flee their homes as a clear example of the people on the margins, the people in greatest need that we are called by our faith to help and support. Um, since that time, Pope Francis has issued a, uh, an encyclical called Fratelli Tutti, um, which incorporates a compelling message about migrants and refugees. It covers a great deal, and I couldn't begin to, to address the depth and breadth of the encyclical, but I do want to lift up some key ideas from the encyclical that really inform our thinking about how our faith calls us to respond to migrants and refugees. So at the heart of um, Fratelli Tutti is the story of the Good Samaritan. And uh, what Pope Francis does is he reminds us of how relevant that story is for us today, how much it means in our lives today. And he really takes a look at the world and all of the challenges that are facing us in the world. And, uh, and he calls us to ask ourselves, who is my neighbor? And um, in uh, his, this, this uh, section on the, the uh, Good Samaritan story, he, he says to us, in the face of so much pain and suffering, our only course is to imitate the Good Samaritan. Any other decision would make us either one of the robbers or one of those who walk by without showing compassion for the sufferings of the man on the side of the road or on the roadside. And as he talks about this question of who is our neighbor and who are the people who are on the side of the road right now? Uh, one of the things he highlights throughout the encyclical is the idea that, that the, the, the question of neighbor, when we hear that word, we think of people down the street or something. But our neighbors, when we understand the teaching of the church, our neighbors can be anywhere. And this is clear from the very first paragraph of the encyclical when he points out how inspired he was in writing this uh, by St. Francis of Assisi. And um, he reminds us that uh, St. Francis calls for a love that transcends the barriers of geography and distance. He declares blessed all those who love their brother as much when he is far away from him as when he is with him. So that idea that the call to love our neighbor in the Good Samaritan story calls us to love our neighbors everywhere is very central to this message from Pope Francis. And, um, he, he uh, in the introductory chapters, he lays out a lot of the challenges and really throughout to a certain extent, lays out a lot of the challenges that we're facing as we look at this call to universal love. And he particularly lifts up the way that migrants um, and refugees are treated uh, as a challenge in, in our world. And he says that uh, today, too often migrants are not seen as entitled like others to participate in the life of society. And it is forgotten that they possess the same intrinsic dignity as any person. Now, we know that migrants and refugees have a, a special place in the heart of Pope Francis. Uh, it, it's been clear from his, the beginning of his pontificate. We've, we've, many of us, I'm sure, have heard the story of his first trip uh, when he went to Lampedusa in Italy to see the refugees that were, were coming across the Mediterranean. Um, and sometimes people try to diminish uh, this message about the importance of, of helping and, and caring for migrants and refugees as kind of the latest trend or a particular interest of Pope Francis. 
And um, so I'd like to take just a minute to remind us that care for migrants and refugees, for people who are leaving their homes, has been a part of our tradition from the very beginning. And so we look at the, the Old Testament and uh, we have that clear message about welcoming the stranger. From Leviticus we have, when a stranger dwells among you in your land, you are not to maltreat him. You shall love him like yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And that continues to be a challenge to us. Are we treating people who are strangers in our land or strangers in lands all over the world like we would want to, to be loved ourselves or are we maltreating them? But it's not just the Old Testament, it's also a very powerful message in the New Testament. And in particular, um, we go to, let me skip that one. Uh, we go to uh, the, the gospel story of Matthew 25, uh, where we have the story of the last judgment. And um, uh, that's such a powerful story. It's the clearest message we have about how our lives will be judged at the end of time. And, and you remember that Jesus tells the story of, of uh, the king dividing the sheep and the goats and, and people are asking, well, you know, how did you make that decision? And he tells them, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When a stranger, and you welcomed me. So among the things that are the measure of how we lived our lives is this question of welcoming the stranger. And the powerfulness of this message is both the fact that it tells us that every person we encounter, including the people who are forced to flee their homes around the world right now, very explicitly referenced here, are Christ himself present with us. And we have to recognize Christ in, the, in those uh, uh, people. Um, but it's also a powerful message just because it is, you know, kind of how we will be judged in the end. I remember being at a, at a Catholic uh, university, not a Jesuit one, but, um, and, and doing some work to, to develop programs to help students get involved and faculty get involved in responding to migrants and refugees and responding to uh, people who are po po in poverty around the world. And the president of the university was explaining why this was important for the university. And he said, to use language that our students understand, we all know what's gonna be on the final exam. That's what Matthew 25 tells us. The question is, are we living our lives in ways that will prepare us to pass? And clearly part of passing that final exam is how we welcome the strangers. So just to um, kind of drive home this point that it's not you know, some kind of extraneous idea or a new idea or just something of interest, particular interest to Pope Francis. I also want to share a, a, a couple of examples from his predecessors about how, um, how, how we should respond to immigrants and migrants and refugees and things. And so from um, St. John Paul II, a very pointed, uh, brief, but clear message, no one should be indifferent to the conditions of multitudes of immigrants. He looked at the conditions of immigrants, migrants, refugees, and he uh, called every one of us, no one should be indifferent. He called every one of us to be responsive to that tragic situation. Um, and then we look to uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI and this message of one, I just chose one because we don't have time to go through uh, too many of them. Um, and he said, all therefore belong to one family migrants and the local populations that welcome them and all have the same right to enjoy the goods of the earth whose destination is universal. So the idea that we have to think of forcibly displaced people, people who have been, who have fled their homes, who are migrants and refugees as part of one family with all of us who, uh, to whom they flee. Um, but I also wanna come back to this idea about uh, their right to enjoy the goods of the earth. Uh, but, but first I wanna go then of course to a message from Pope Francis about this particular topic, the uh, question of migrants and refugees. Uh, and again, from Fratelli Tutti where this, uh, uh, there are many important messages, but this, this topic of migrants and refugees comes up quite a bit. And he says, um, if every human being possesses an inalienable dignity, if all people are my brothers and sisters, and if the world truly belongs to everyone, then it matters little whether my neighbor was born in my country or elsewhere. So again, this message that our neighbor is everywhere 
And we can't just say that it's, you know, the people down the street that I have to pay attention to, but that we are called to look at people all over the world. And I think that this um, quote in particular lifts up what this topic of migrants and refugees has to do with some key dimensions of Catholic teaching, Catholic social teaching in particular. So he starts with this idea that every human being has inalienable dignity created in God's image and likeness as a child of God. And so when we see people in boats in the Mediterranean or at the border of the US, we have to remember that they have the same inherent dignity that every one of us has. They are our brothers and sisters, the idea of solidarity. And in particular, this quote tells us about global solidarity, that it's for people everywhere. They are our brothers and sisters. We are one human fa family and living in solidarity is essential to who we are and what we believe as Catholics. And then we have this idea that if the world truly belongs to everyone, and he's going through a list of things that, you know, we agree and or we, we believe. And if we do believe that, then it doesn't matter where people come from. But this goes back to the idea in the previous quote from uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict that the, the people, all people have the rights to enjoy the goods of the earth whose destination is universal. It's a very powerful message in Catholic teaching that the goods of the earth are meant to uh, be shared and to uh, promote the common good and to promote the well being of all. And so this is a compliment to Catholic teaching about. Uh, private property, uh, because while the church very much affirms each person's right to private property, we also understand that private property has to be understood and, um, and uh, um, kind of used through the lens of our faith. And the lens of our faith calls us to use everything that we have to promote the common good, to help others. Um, and so that idea that even though we do have private property, it should help contribute to the good of all. Now, um, I, I, I want to uh, do a little bit of a pivot here and talk a little bit about what we mean by refugees and migrants and, and, and uh, dig into that topic, that reality a little bit. And so I'll start by uh, this definition from the UN about what a refugee is. A refugee is someone who has been forced to flee his or her, her country because of persecution, war, or violence. A refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. <clears throat> so, um, you know, again, there are these criteria um, that refugees uh, are, are, um, are uh, the, the determine the term, determination that they are a refugee that it, it's based on that they are facing these kinds of fears of persecution and war and violence, etc. For these reasons, um, here is a little bit of information about the current reality of refugees. Although this is all from 2019, the numbers aren't out yet from 2020, and I'm sure that things have only gotten worse. But in, in 2019, there were 80 million, nearly 80 million, forcibly displaced people worldwide. Now, um, I want to highlight these terms uh, because uh, forcibly displaced people is a big category that includes all kinds of people who have been forced to flee their homes and no matter what happens to them through that process and whatnot. Refugees are people who meet the criterion in the previous slide, uh, but also um, uh, have, have uh, fled their homes, crossed an international border, and have applied to become a refugee who will then be resettled in yet another country. Now, the next category listed here, so 26 million refugees, the next category here is there are nearly 46 million internally displaced people. These are people who have been forced to flee their homes and they often face the same uh, crises that are described in the, in the UN definition, de definition of refugee, but they have not crossed an international border. So they're still in their home country but they are often in the same difficult conditions, refugee camps and whatnot, that, that we think of when we hear the word refugee or refugee camp. Then there are asylum seekers and they are people who are wanting to claim the same, uh, that they meet the same criteria uh, that we just saw, but they uh, make that claim when they have already arrived at the country to which they would like to, to, to uh, or in which they would like to resettle. So what we hear a lot about at the US-Mexico border is asylum seekers because they present themselves on US soil, even if it's at a, at a border crossing point, at a, at a, um, a border patrol point, 
they present themselves on US soil and request asylum. So the difference, a refugee is someone in another country waiting to be identified as a refugee and then resettle. An asylum seeker comes to the country they want to settle in and uh, request asylum. Um, and then you'll see they, they separate out Venezuelans for reasons I won't go into, but, um, but you can get a sense. I just want to say a, a word about this um, nearly 80 million people. If that population were a country, it would be bigger than the country of Italy. It would be bigger than the United Kingdom. And just in 2019, that, that uh, number grew by 9 million. It was closer to 70 million uh, before that. And it grew by 9 million. And in one year, that's the number roughly of the population of New York City. So you get a sense of how massive this challenge is that is facing millions and millions of people uh, around the world. Few other things about um, the reality of refugees right now. We often think of reg refugee camps, but actually 60% of ref refugees uh, live in urban areas. So they fled from Syria to Beirut, and now they're living in some community uh, in Beirut. Um, the estimated average length of displacement is 10 to 20 years. I know that's a huge gap, but it really, it's very hard to track. Um, so the, the, the data is a little soft and, um, and uh, it, you know, so it depends on which study you look at. But in some ways, it doesn't matter. We think of refugees as people who have fled to a camp somewhere, and then they're going to apply for refugee stat status, and they're going to be resettled in Canada or the US or Australia or something like that. That's not happening for the vast majority of refugees. In fact, as you see, less than 1% of refugees were resettled to a country like the US last year. So most people are staying wherever they fled in these really difficult conditions for decades and they have to be able to be supported to build a life uh, in that context. Um, just a word about the US refugee uh, 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 policies. Uh, the US refugee ha uh, policies have been on a decline. They've been uh, reduced over the last few years at one point, and it depends on what period of years you, you track to come up with an average, but, but the average was somewhere in the 80 to 90,000 a year, depending on what years you count. Um, this the, for the current year for 2021, President Trump had established the limit at 15,000. Um, but now President Biden is promising to raise that up to 125,000. Uh, so uh, we'll see how that mo moves forward because there's the capacity that has been diminished uh, to resettle people in this country as the numbers have gone down and we'll have to rebuild the, not just name the number, but rebuild the capacity to actually do it. And then one other um, point about refugees that is really worth uh, attending uh, to is the impact on children. Uh, at least 40% of all displaced people are children, more than 50% of refugees, but it's probably more like 50% if we could have really accurate numbers, this is probably an undercount of all displaced people are children. And what that means and, and you can see more than half of all refugee children are not in school and you can see the, the numbers by um, uh, school level uh, and, and it's way below for elementary school in the world it's well over 95% that uh, have access to primary school but for refugees and displaced people it's only 63% but, but a, a key point I want to make is this um, image that you have on this slide because this was a, a picture drawn by a child who had fled Syria uh, and had, had uh, his family had moved to Jordan. And when he was given crayons and a piece of paper, this is what he drew. And it always breaks my heart when I see this drawing because um, the idea that there are tens of millions of children in the world who have been through experiences that so traumatize them that when you give them crayons, they don't draw flowers or rainbows or sun and the house and their family or something like that, but they draw violence and war and, and people who are dying. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. And I often ask myself and others that I uh, speak to about this, how can we possibly expect that in the future we will have a more just and peaceful world when tens of millions of children, an, an entire generation practically in some countries, have been so traumatized and have been such, through such difficult experiences. If we turn our back now, I don't know how they recover from this. Now is the time for us to be responding to them and helping them so that all of us can have a, a better world in the future. Now, 
When I talk about uh, migrants and refugees, and especially this kind of information with statistics and things, I always like to share some stories of the people I've experienced because it's not just statistics. It's important to know that they are real human being in real settings that, that uh, uh, is often um, a little bit off our radar. Um, so the, speaking of being off our radar, the first one that I wanna share is uh, has to do with what I'm sure uh, many of you will remember, which is that about 17 years ago or so, uh, we were all watching the news for a period of time uh, and, there, uh, and, and what we learned about was the genocide in Darfur in Western Sudan. And uh, we were all horrified uh, and we were watching every night as violence forced people to flee. Um, and you know, part of what was so heartbreaking was that you know, after the Holocaust, we all said never again. And then we saw in particular, I mean, there have been other genocide, but in, in particular, we saw Rwanda. And then we really said, never again will the world stand by and watch a genocide happen. And then we were watching in Darfur that this was happening again. And, and we were horrified. And, and I, I know you, some of you probably shared my feeling that like, I can't sit back and, and, and do nothing. What really shocked me was that about a year and a half ago, I visited Eastern Chad and the people who fled Darfur are still there in Eastern Chad living in refugee camps in really difficult conditions. And this is what I saw when I was there. Um, the day I was there, it was about 112 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. <laughs> and, um, and just people struggling all these years later and, and, and a, a little bit heartbroken that the world has forgotten them. And, and we have, I mean, nobody's paying attention. When was the last time that anybody, I mean, I do because of my work, but any of most of us thought about the people who were fleeing the genocide in Darfur. But it's also a story of great resilience as it always is when I meet refugees and, and displaced people. It's a story of resilience and determination and hope and just such impressive people, so many of them. So I wanted to share the story of Busena uh, who came as, as a child with her family, fled Darfur, came to this camp and um, was able to get an education because of a, a school that JRS uh, runs in the camp. That continues to be the case. But she was very bright and very determined and we helped her move on from the schooling that we could give in the camp to go to, uh, to get some uh, health uh, uh, assistant credentials and eventually become a, a certified midwife. And she chose after doing that, she didn't go to N'Djamena, the capital, and you know, try to build a really good life for herself or something. She came back to the camp and is serving there as, as, a, as a midwife and, and a, a, a healthcare provider. And, um, and just has such a heart and so much hope and so much resilience and determination that she is worth lifting up. She's one of the people that, that inspires me in my work. I also wanna say um, a word about kind of the reality right now uh, in, in uh, uh, focusing on the US-Mexico border, which I'm sure you're all following. Um, you, you know that uh, through the migra uh, migrant protection protocols or the remain in Mexico policy, uh, 65,000 people have been sent back to Mexico, many of them living in just squalid conditions along the border, waiting for their opportunity to make their case for asylum. Um, which is a part of our international law that people who uh, have a, a credible fear for their lives for those reasons should have the right to uh, apply for asylum and to, and to seek protection. And up until recently, they were allowed to wait for their court case to go through in the US in, in, a, in a place of safety uh, uh, until it was determined, if it was determined that, that they really did not qualify for asylum and then they would be deported, they would be sent back. But now they're in Mexico in terrible conditions. Um, and, and the heartbreak of what people who are coming up there, up to the border, uh, came home for me when I was uh, visiting Guatemala uh, several years ago. And I met a mother who was waiting for her daughter, her teenage daughter, to be returned to her her daughter had tried to make the trek up to the US. She had relatives in the US and was hoping to uh, make it into the US and be able to, to live there and have a better life. And um, you know, she, she was gonna get on the beast, the train that we hear such horror stories about what young women uh, uh, can, can face in those, uh, you know, on that trip and everything. And so the mother was waiting and, and I have a daughter 
And, and I thought well, how heartbreaking it must have been to send her on that trip and all the danger she would be in and things. And I, and I said to her, you know, it must have been so hard for you to send her to go on that trip. Uh, uh, tell me about that. And she said, um, the gangs came to us and said they wanted to take her as a gang wife. And she looked at me and she said, what would you do for your daughter? And I thought immediately that I would do whatever it took to try to get my daughter to safety. I mean, there are no good choices for so many of these folks who are at the U.S.-Mexico border. And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's a place where we have to understand people better and try to come up with a system that allows them to go through the process in safety in order to seek safety. And then just one other thing I'll mention is the impact of COVID-19 uh, on displaced people around the world that we're seeing. There are parts of the world that it has not ravaged as much as it has other parts of the world. Some places uh, in Africa and other places, South Africa right now, it's just uh, really in ter a terrible situation. But um, under all circumstances, the lockdowns and the uh, precautionary steps we have to take are such a difficulty for displaced people. Um, when we're told to wear masks, we go out and buy masks, most of us. Uh, when we're told to wash our hands, we go to our sink and wash our hands. These are all things that displaced people, uh, wherever they are, uh, cannot do. They don't have the money to buy masks. They don't have even hand washing stations in a lot of cases. Um, and even classrooms, they don't have Wi-Fi. They can't go digital. And the classrooms are, are often just packed. I mean, I have seen in, in some places where we serve 75 students in a class, 90 students in a class. You can't spread that out. The teacher would have to have a PA system or something to try to communicate. So our colleagues around the world have done a remarkable job uh, finding ways to continue education remotely in places where uh, there is no Wi-Fi. You can't do digital learning or any of that kind of stuff. And I could tell you uh, some of those details, but but just to understand the impact of this, um, the UN is estimating that 20 million girls will not be going back to school this year, 20 million. Um, and what me that means for girls in particular, they are uh, least, they have the lowest access to, to schooling. It means they're more at risk for child marriage. They're more at risk for teenage pregnancy. They're more at risk for human trafficking. Um, and, and it really just means a lifetime of poverty. But again, even in the COVID-19 context, there are amazing stories of resilience and hope and kindness and things. And so uh, just one example is a, a refugee camp that we serve in India, where when the pandemic broke out, we had been um, in uh, previous years training people to be tailors and seamstresses. They, they you know, had good sewing skills and they came to our staff and they said, if you will give us the um, uh, material, we will sew masks for the refugees in this camp. And they said, we not only want to so make sure we serve the refugees in the camp, but we wanna make masks for our host community as well. So we hope we can get that much material and be able to make those masks. And they said, we know that we have to not only serve ourselves, but our entire host community, because we realize that we are all in this together when it comes to the pandemic. And I thought what a powerful um, insight they had that um, sadly not, not everybody has. Um, so I'd like to share with you a little bit uh, now about what, uh, how JRS responds to this as a work of the Society of Jesus. Um, and uh, as, as Father Shea said, we were formed uh, 40 years ago. Uh, I'm sure Pedro Rupe would be shocked to find out that the need is so huge. We're now in 56 countries and serving nearly 800,000 people. But I want to highlight something Pope Francis says in Fratelli Tutti again, a quote that I think is powerful when we, um, when I try to explain to you how I see JRS and its role, and especially JRS USA for all of us. Pope Francis said, um, yet let us not do this alone as individuals. He's talking about being the good Samaritan in our world, responding to people on the side of the, on the, side of the road. He says, the Samaritan discovered an innkeeper who would care for the man. We too are called to unite as a family that is stronger than the sum of small individual members. So he calls us to all work together to respond to the, the people who are suffering in the world that, that we encounter in our world today. And I think JRS is a vehicle through which we can all respond to refugees and displaced people around the world. 
And you see our motto there, there Father Shea mentioned it, accompany, serve, and advocate. And um, I'll just say a word about accompany because it is um, a, really a characteristic, having been in this work for many years before I joined JRS, it is a characteristic of the work of JRS that is rooted in um, uh, the Jesuit charism that um, is, it makes a real difference. And I've had people visit JRS uh, uh, programs who make that point that they see a different quality about the relationship between JRS staff and, and the people we serve um, that is truly relational and not transactional. And uh, so that's a very important part of our identity that I think is, is very much connected to our Jesuit identity. Um, we have several key priority areas, program areas that I'll just go through quickly. The first one is uh, reconciliation. And it's basically that idea that when, especially when people are traumatized, especially when people are dropped into a community who haven't lived there before, um, everybody uh, is in need of help to uh, build peace, to establish you know, what in kind of the technical circles they call social cohesion. But you can imagine how much tension there can be if we don't attend to the need to to promote reconciliation and peace building. And um, just to say a word that we uh, uh, especially focus on religious values, no matter what people's religious values are, because there is a lot of uh, uh, that we have in common across religious traditions uh, that, that have to do with peace and loving our neighbor and serving our neighbor and things. And if that can be the foundation that we see our similarities before we see our differences, it can make all the difference. And one of the areas where we really affirm people's um, various faith traditions and, and hopefully tell them something about who we are as Catholics and as a Jesuit organization uh, is in uh, detention centers in the US and five detention centers where people are being detained by the US uh, almost all before they're deported. But um, we support them, certainly the Catholics, but people of all trace faith traditions, we try to make sure it's possible for them to practice their religion as a way of, of recognizing um, the importance of that in, in their lives and our desire to help them uh, deal with the stresses and, and the difficulties that they're facing. Um, another priority for JRS USA is mental health and psychosocial support. I mentioned this already when we saw the trauma that children go through. We can't say that we're going to teach a child to do math and think that's going to do it when they haven't dealt with the trauma that they've been through. So we have a lot of different ways of doing that, pastoral counseling uh, for people in detention in the US. You can see that picture there. The picture in the upper left is uh, what we call home visitors. And we train refugees themselves to uh, visit other refugees and just listen and be a friend and a support. And um, often we can't do what they need, they need more money and we don't have unlimited, you know, we, uh, sometimes we give out small cash amounts, but you know, in general, we can't, we can't meet all their needs, but we can be there to support them. And I've walked through neighborhoods where we have home visitors um, in Amman, Jordan, and also in Beirut. And I mean, people come out of their homes when the home visitors, the JRS home visitors come through and are just like, you know, come and visit me again. We miss you. I, you know, I want to see you. And um, it clearly means so much to them to have people who honor them as human beings, who think they're important and who think they're worth supporting and, and, and being uh, uh, kind to. Um, another uh, priority that we have is education. That won't come as a surprise. Uh, uh, we're a Jesuit organization. We bring a lot of edu education experience and we do it at every single level. And again, it's because we recognize that we, if, if refugees have food and shelter and water, but they don't have education for, for their children or training for the uh, adults or, or uh, young adults, they will never be able to rebuild their lives. Education is essential, essential to rebuilding lives. And we have to figure out how to get them education that equips them to, to, to um, support their families and to, to build a, a full life later in life. And we tie that, uh, for that reason, we tie it to a commitment. One of our priorities is the intersection of education and livelihoods, even though early childhood education doesn't have a direct tie to livelihoods, but we have to see it as a pathway because you don't want to um, educate people in a way they get, you know, like an associate's degree in liberal, uh, a liberal arts associate degree, and then they're in a camp there are no jobs for people with that training. 
but maybe there are jobs for plumbers who are gonna uh, repair the water and sanitation system in the camp. So the first thing we do with livelihoods is to do a market assessment. What can the labor market support? And then we build livelihoods programs to, to uh, fit that. We're also doing a lot of digital uh, training and that's very exciting for me because uh, what students are learning is to do coding, they're learning basic, um, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft products and things like that. And that means that they, and we've set up some systems so they can get a job directly from a camp, for example, in Malawi, they can get a job directly with a company in Canada or in France, and they can get paid directly all digitally. And they're making a life for themselves. They skip over the limitations of the geographic economy and go straight to the digital economy. And it's it's a game changer for people who are stuck for 10 or 20 years or more in a, in a, a remote camp. And the final point there is uh, mentors, which are essential. They're a part of all of our livelihoods programs because they're essential to that, to supporting people as they go through that. And then the final priority for JRS globally is um, advocacy. We support refugees' voices globally wherever they can be advocates. In some places, that would be too dangerous. But, um, but where they can, we definitely support that. And then we do a lot of advocacy here in the US. And I'll be saying uh, just a little bit more about that in just a minute. So, um, so I wanna look uh, now in a kind of a final section here to ourselves here in the US and consider for those of us who want to live our faith and have a heart for families who have been forced to flee their homes, how are we called to, um, to uh, connect our faith to those families? And here is a message again from Fratelli Tutti from Pope Francis that um, talks about how our faith shapes the most practical dimensions of our lives. And he says, the decision to include or exclude those lying wounded along the roadside can serve as a criterion for judging every economic, political, social, and religious project. So he calls us to take this message of loving our neighbor that is central to the gospel and to our understanding of our faith into the most practical dimensions of our lives. And I'd like to suggest that JRS, as I said, I think JRS is one of the way where we can all join together as a family to respond to the needs of refugees and migrants. And so I'd like to share with you some of the ways that JRS um, offers all of us a chance to do that. Um, we have kind of a, a little bit of a motto, which is do one thing, um, also a hashtag for social media, but, um, but it's that idea that it can be overwhelming to look at 80 million people and countries all over the world, and it's such a big problem. But if we all do one thing, it adds up to a lot. And so I hope we will all think about what is the one thing we can do. Well, one of the things we can do clearly is pray in solidarity with refugees and migrants. And it's something that we have resources for all the time. But I wanted to lift up something that we have coming up for Lent, which is our 40 Minutes for Refugees initiative, where we're asking people to commit to spend 10 minutes every day praying, fasting, and or giving alms in solidarity with refugees and displaced people. We have Lots of resources on our website. Um, you can see the, the link there. Um, I hope you'll think about joining us during Lent for that initiative. Another thing we can do is to stay updated on what is going on around the world and what, uh, where are the key challenges that where people are being forced to flee their homes and, and how they're faring where they arrive uh, after they have fled. Um, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter, easy to read, has a few headlines and you can read more based on, on what seems most interesting to you. So it's a quick read, can be a quick read. Um, another thing that we ask you to do is to share the story of refugees. There was a study recently, and I cannot remember now um, where it was, but that, um, that when refugees were asked, what are the biggest challenges they face? One of the key challenges they list is the misperceptions about refugees the um, misunderstanding about refugees. And there's been such a negative narrative about people who have fled their homes. And um, it, so it's an important step to take to share their stories and help people understand that most migrants and refugees are really amazingly resilient uh, people who want to contribute and want to support their families. Then we have the opportunity to write to a refugee. And um, the way this works is your family or your youth group or your faith, or, um, a faith formation class can write little cards to refugees 
send them to JRS in Washington. So we collect them all and then we hand deliver them when we travel to visit our programs. And you'll see some um, young adult students who are in an English class. When, when I've been there, I've done this. And when they receive these cards, they're first of all, first of all so touched that there are people in the US thinking about them and writing them cards that just is astounding to them and, and just means so much to them. And then because they all want to learn English, they devour every one of the class and nobody wants to miss a card because it's all a way to practice their English and, and uh, you know, kind of in the, in the natural way that an American would, would speak it. So you could consider doing that. We have a refugee simulation that had been developed for when we can all be in a room together, but we've now turned it into something that also has a, a digital dimension. And um, so I hope you'll think in any groups that you have meeting digitally uh, to, to do that. Also, you could lead a JRS refugee action team. These are forming on college campuses and high schools and parishes. So that's another option. We have a toolkit to help you do that. Um, volunteering, a little harder now, but there are ways that we can help. But this is not something specific to JRS. This is, uh, I, but I want to acknowledge that there are local groups in almost every city that are supporting migrants and refugees. And, and it's, it's always important to support them uh, there in the local community. And of course, support the mission. All of the things I've been talking about are possible because generous people in the US see our, uh, the gifts that have been given to us by God as an opportunity to live our faith and, and be the Good Samaritan and be helpful and, and contribute to, to JRS and its work. Um, and then finally, I really wanna highlight, become an advocate with us. This is uh, more important than ever in some ways because we have so many opportunities um, to, to make a, uh, an impact on policies. We are gonna have an advocacy day on Thursday, April 15th. So I hope you'll go to our website and, and sign up for that. People all over the country will be setting up virtual meetings with the offices of their members of Congress. In some cases, they're Congress people directly, but sometimes staff. And, um, and you can be a part of that national effort to uh, uh, deliver messages and support of migrants and refugees to the 117th Congress. And just to lift up, um, there are so many important issues coming up. One of the ones that we are just in the process of really refining our messaging on, but it has to do with vaccine equity. We know that the, in the world, uh, the wealthy nations are, are buying the vaccines and poorer nations have less access, lower access to the vaccines. And at the very back of that line are the people who are not even citizens of a nation at this point where they're living, where they're displaced and they're in camps and things like that. And we can't let refugees just be completely forgotten as we consider the system for getting, especially refugees who are high risk. We have to get them out, uh, get, get them access to, to uh, and get the, the vaccines out to them as well. So vaccine equity is going to be an issue, um, funding, for um, rebuilding after the pandemic, for education right now in emergencies, to have the resources to do it, 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 it you know, the, how we support our foreign assistance program, how we support UNHCR. There are multilateral programs, something called Education Cannot Wait, where the US and many countries and, and institutions support, and then that supports uh, education in these uh, emergency settings where refugees find themselves. And then of course, all of the US um, immigration and asylum policies that are, uh, it, you know, under consideration right now, uh, you know, with the MPP policy that has been rolled back, deportations were halted, but then a court put a stay on that. Um, there are other executive orders uh, expected on Wednesday uh, to address issues that support people, uh, things like the family reunification for the families that were separated by the U.S., uh, things like help allowing certain children uh, kind of a, a facilitated path to asylum or refugee status. Um, and there's also something that President Biden has um, uh, uh, put together called the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021 that has both like $4 billion to help Central American countries address the issues there so that people are not, don't feel that they're forced to flee their homes, but also uh, builds up our border agent uh, capacity, technology capacity at the, at the border, immigration court capacity so that we can go through this backlog created by MPP and begin to have a more um, uh, systematic uh, asylum process that honors the fact that people have a right to seek safety if they have a genuine fear for their safety in their home country. 
Um, so I would be happy to talk more about those policies or any of this. And I'm going to stop right now and um, ask uh, if there are questions. And I think Peter is going to manage the questions. Thank you, Joan. Um, so we are going to take about a five minute break or so, so people can step away from their computers if they wish. Um, that's also an opportunity to use the Q&A. Uh, you can type a question there um, and we will try to field those to Joan um, and curate them a little bit so that if there are similar questions, um, we can kind of lump those together. So let's take about a five minute break and come back in a bit and uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, Peter, this is Gene. Can I say one thing before we leave? Yes, please. We do have a bit of capacity on the attendee side of the, uh, of the participation group here. So if any of you who are panelists want to ask a question, click on the raise hand icon on your screen. I will then try to convert you to an attendee and that would give you access to the Q&A feature. So again, click on the raise hand and I will convert you over and that should give you access to the Q&A. Excellent. We'll see you all shortly then.
Okay, Joan, if, if you are ready. Sure. We can field some questions to you. Um, you may have answered this one already, but the first question that came in is, uh, has any Catholic group tried to help refugees coming across the Mexican border? Um, wow, uh, yes. Uh, it not only has any group, but there are lots of groups that are responding. I mean, I think we can really be proud that this message about uh, welcoming the stranger is, is uh, uh, not lost on the Catholic community and that across the border in Arizona and, and Texas and even California, there are the local diocesan Catholic charities organizations. There are groups like um, the Catholic Legal Immigration Network that's very present. We're just launching a program in El Paso and Juarez because there's a JRS Mexico and a JRS USA, so we can work together. That's going to focus on uh, mental health and psychosocial support, which is not um, as why it was one of the gaps that we heard uh, was particularly needed there, and um, and also legal services. What we will be helping with there, um, the Kino Border Initiative in Nogales. So there are lots of Catholic groups that are that are stepping up and really trying to help people who are suffering. We're, that's what we are called to do and be as Catholics, and um, and we are there. A later question was kind of similar to that about um, are you folks at JRS working in connection with the Kino Border Initiative? You may have just mentioned that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we, um, we were um, there at the beginning helping to form the Kino Border Initiative in Nogales and um, continue to be very involved. In fact, the way it's structured, I'm on the board of members. And so we just had a board me meeting yesterday. And I uh, spent a couple of hours um, on work related to the Kino Border Initiative. So. We definitely do, but we also recognize that there's so much need that we don't want to, to duplicate or you know all focus on the same area. So where we can support Kino, we definitely do that. But um, when we were looking at where we would launch a program, we focused on El Paso and Juarez because um, we didn't we didn't need another organization in, in Nogales, um, but there was more of a, a need for an organization or for us to bring some programming to El Paso and, and Juarez. Good. Another question is about healthcare, and you mentioned this a little bit about, especially COVID nineteen and vaccination. But um, the question is: undocumented immigrants have difficult access to, to health assistance in the U.S. How can we help them um, have access to the vaccine, and since they're not part of a, of a healthcare system? Obviously. Um, what's being done to assist them? Maybe a little more specific than what you mentioned before? Sure. Um, I, I, well, I think there are two dimensions to this. One is uh, has to do with the policies and how decisions are made about who gets the vaccine and who qualifies for the vaccine and things. And um, particularly uh, in the U.S., I think you can look to groups like Catholic Charities USA to provide guidance on the policies that you would want to follow and weigh in on um, as it relates to distribution in the US uh, to undocumented people and things. Um, uh, and, then, and then I think uh, in it, it, maybe I would turn to the local Catholic charities as a place to find out where it's possible or if you have a background in healthcare and you can safely be a part of distribution and things, how you can volunteer to help with that. Because it is, it's such a massive undertaking that we all know how complicated it is to figure out how to get a vaccine and where to get a vaccine. And people who have Spanish language skills and things I'm sure are needed in local communities to help um, with the education about that and things. So I would, I would contact the local Catholic Charities Agency and see uh, what they can recommend for you. Right, I think um, Cindy uh, Rice has answered one of the questions about local involvement and in that. So thank you, Cindy, for doing that. Um, answering the question uh, online, there uh, there are a couple of questions about local assistance and how to get involved in the Charlotte area. So th thank you very much, Cindy. Um, another question, following a natural disaster, many have compassion for economic condition refugees who lost homes, livelihoods, etc. I hear less compassion among friends and businesses when it's not tied to an event like a natural disaster or their concern is that it, this seems to undermine common immigration requests. What are your thoughts about that? 
Well, yes, it's definitely true that when, um, I guess there are two dimensions to the dynamic. One is that when people see the images of people struggling and, and their homes destroyed and they've lost everything, then our, you know, we, our compassion is, is brought forth and that's a good thing and, and we do respond to that. But it then fades when it's not in front of us. It's easy to forget, just like the victims of the Darfur genocide uh, are, have been easy for us to, to forget. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, figuring out how people can help is another uh, challenge, which is why this idea of looking for the places where we can um, come together and, you know, the, the um, you know, whole is greater than the sum of the parts kind of thing uh, is important. And for international work, that's organizations like JRS um, and for local situations that that's organizations like Catholic Charities and other service age organizations in your in your community. But um, it is a challenge. There's also the, the, the problem that there are some kind of slow onset crises and they don't get the attention and we aren't mm -hmm. as tuned into it. You know, the fact, for example, in, in Central America, the, the changes in weather patterns have made it diff very difficult for people who have historically been and, you know, for generations been coffee farmers. They can't grow coffee anymore. They don't know how to grow other things. They don't necessarily have access to the to the materials that they need, the production materials that they need for other crops. Um, and so sometimes they choose to leave because there's nothing they can do. They can't support their family. But that 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 weather pattern change uh, that has led to repeated either repeated um, failures of crops or uh, crop disease that hadn't occurred before. You know, we don't see that in the way we see a hurricane. And what's happening with the hurricane. So those slow onset um, uh, disasters, droughts in different that just go on for years in different parts of the world, or um, you know, uh, uh, you know, flooding in ways that didn't happen. But sometimes it's not big enough to be a big hurricane. But and so we don't, just don't see it. And I think being uh, it's one of the things we try to do with our newsletter too to kind of highlight some of the things that are going on that may not be as visible otherwise. So here's a, a kind of a two part related question. Um, what might we expect in this in our own local area um, as we gear up to assist with welcoming refugees and kind of maybe this is the prior question. Do you think that the 125,000 that the president has um, sort of indicated, do you think that's realistic expectation? Well, Should we be prepared to welcome that many refugees and how can we be prepared to do it? Yeah. Um, you, you know, in some ways I would say it is both realistic and it's not realistic. So um, it, it, there, there, it, there's definitely going to be a challenge in rebuilding the capacity to, to resettle refugees at that, at that rate because it, it has to do with human resources that the resettlement agencies have and they haven't been able to keep everybody on through this process when it's dropped so low. But they will be able to rebuild that. It just won't, it won't be instantaneously uh, available, but they will be able to rebuild that. And I think that as a, you know, as a, as a, as a uh, kind of goal for us as the United States, given the size of our population, 125,000 people can easily be absorbed in our country uh, and, and, and welcomed and integrated into our country. So I think we just have to do the work of, of building up the capacity or rebuilding the capacity. And it's both the resettlement agencies being able to rebuild their staff and be ready to do this and the rest of us volunteering to help. And especially when it comes to integration into the community, there, that's an important role that um, uh, religious communities, faith communities can do and, and others can do to support people who are being resettled. So um, it's, it, you know, it, it, the, the infrastructure has diminished as the numbers have gone down, but it's not unrealistic to think that we can rebuild that in infrastructure and we should, and as a country, given our population, we can absorb that many people easily. Good. Here's the kind of pivot a little bit uh, and perhaps a little bit more personal question. Um, from your experience, your long experience uh, working with the bishops and with CRS and now with JRS um, and serving in the church, how do you perceive women's roles in the church changing? What avenues do you see for the future of Catholic women and having um, their own roles in ministry and leadership and so on? 
Well, I have definitely seen um, a, a progression of women uh, more and more in leadership roles at every level of the church. And, um, uh, you know, that's true at the bishops conference. And there were very definitely women in leadership roles whose uh, 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 participation in the work of the bishops uh, as, a, as a national group was taken very seriously. Um, definitely at the organization CRS at JRS. Um, there are more and more women leading uh, uh, Jesuit works that used to be led by Jesuits. And now they're led by lay people and, and, and including uh, more and more, there are women in leadership roles um, uh, like the role that I have. And, um, and, I, and I, I find that there's a real openness to it. I had a chance to ask um, uh, uh, Father General uh, Sosa, uh, the Superior General of the Jesuits, you know, his point of view, because the, uh, there was a group of, of women who had gathered to talk with him about the, the future of the role of women um, in the, in the um, mission and ministry of the Jesuits. Uh, and, and he was just so open and so committed to have this conversation and to continue the conversation with us. So I'm very encouraged by that. It's not that I have never run into a situation where I felt that there was either some um, uh, you know, dismissiveness of the role of a woman or myself as a woman, or maybe a little clericalism and things. That certainly is not the case that I've never encountered that. And, and I think what you have to do is call it out. I mean, we're all human beings, whether it's a bishop or, you know, another leader in the Jesuits or whatever it is, we're all human beings and we have to um, speak uh, and, and, and work truthfully together. And if I'm experiencing something like that, I have to, I have to name it and I, we have to work uh, together on it. But I have never found a, a, a refusal to work together on it. Terrific. I just want to say too, I see that Cynthia Aziz, uh, one of our committee members answered that previous question about uh, locally working with getting ready to accept refugees. So thanks Cynthia for typing in that, that answer. Um, uh, a couple of, you might think more technical questions here. Uh, one person says they're so proud of the work that JRS is doing and they'd love to get a copy of the PowerPoint. I will say that this session is being recorded and will be available on the parish YouTube, but um, uh, might it be possible to, to get the PowerPoint? Uh, is yes, that a... Yeah. Uh, of course, yeah, I can imagine in some cases having the slides <clears throat> to, to use in different ways would be helpful. So I'll be ha happy to send, well, we'll have to figure out the technology of getting it like Dropbox or yeah. something. Yeah, I'll get Perhaps it. you can work with Joan Guthrie to, yeah. to do that. Great, Good. perfect. And then um, there's there's a question here. Of, this is maybe more for Jean. So Jean, you may want to answer this uh, by voice or just type in an answer, but uh, a <laughs> person wants to know, it says, congratulations on presenting a webinar where everybody can be heard. Uh, can you give any tips on how to do this? There's so many webinars where voice goes bad and things are wrong. Gene, you have any advice? Uh, yeah, Peter, the advice is to invite folks to participate who are cooperative and know how to use the mute button on their screen. <laughs> that, that usually helps. Uh, it's good to have a little practice ahead of time to make sure the equipment is working, that you've got a good microphone. But it, the most important thing is, is to have uh, all the participants cooperate in muting when they're not speaking. And I think that goes a long way. And I would imagine too that, that good Wi-Fi connections, good internet connections are also vital. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That is the end of the questions so far. So I think we can wrap things up. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for participating and for being with us today. And I'll give Joan the last word. All right, thank you very much. Um, there are so many powerful messages in Fratelli Tutti and I found one that really hit me when I read it and I thought it was an appropriate way for us to end this discussion together today. And what Pope Francis says, I can, oh, except my, There we go. What he says is that each day we have to decide whether to be good Samaritans or indifferent bystanders. Very powerful and helpful message for all of us to think about each day. 
So I thank you for being a part of thinking about that today with me and on the topic of migrants and refugees. And I hope that um, JRS USA can continue to work with the community at St. Peter's and, and all of you to um, provide the support to be the Good Samaritans for migrants and refugees in our world today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Joan.